Well, you know, we get all of our ideas about justice from the Bible and from the character of God. All the way through the Bible, God is presented as the God of justice, the one who is just. He gives rules and laws that need to be obeyed. He warns about the consequences if those rules are not obeyed. All the way through the Bible, God is ordering the world. And in some ways, that's what justice means. Everything being in the right order, everything being in place. We still sometimes use that word to justify when we're talking about lining up text so it all is in line. Or if it's in a building project and we need to get two items lined up properly together, we, we call it being justified. And that's what God is doing all the way through the Bible, setting the world in order. Now, of course, his ultimate act of justice was sending his son, the Lord Jesus, to die in our place so that we can be reconciled to our father. That was the ultimate act of reordering a world gone wrong. That was the ultimate act of justice. But all the way through the Bible, there's lots of little acts of justice, little in relation to Jesus' death, but still really important. For instance, all the warnings that says, if you sell goods, you must use the right weights and measures. You can't shortchange people. All the rules that said uh, that if you buy property, someone else can't come and take it away from you. The rules in the Ten Commandments about uh, pr pr protecting marriage and about not stealing from your neighbour. All of these were God's little acts of justice that were leading to the grand act of justice in Jesus justifying us all. First of all, it explains to us, it conveys to us what God is like, that we don't worship uh, an angry dictator, a capricious ruler who will change his mind, that God loves order and justice, that he is reliable, that he is consistent, that when he says something, he will do it. So all the works of justice help us build up our understanding of what God is really like. And the second reason is for our benefit. Humans flourish when justice is possible. We know that at a small level. We know that we flourish when if something went wrong, we could call the police and someone would come and help us. We know that we flourish when we can buy property and know that that transaction will be secure. We know we can flourish when if we enter into a contract, it will be enforced. In all sorts of ways, God's justice conveys his character and allows for human beings to flourish. That's why justice is so important. I grew up in a church that was really great in so many, many ways, but which had very little understanding of God's justice or had the command to seek justice. It says in the book of Micah, act justly, love mercy and walk humbly with God. We were quite good or we worked hard at any rate at walking humbly with God and we were quite merciful, but we didn't have much idea of justice. Two things changed me most significantly on this. And one was a lost boy and the other was a weeping bishop. The lost boy was a guy called Steve who was maybe 18, 19 when I met him. He was from Jamaica. I was church planting in South East London at the time. And Steve just turned up in our little church, our little church plant youth project. And he was one of the most lost people I've ever met. He had arrived in England, Lord only knows how, from Jamaica, searching for his dad. He had never met his dad, but there was a story in his family that his dad had left Jamaica and come to England. That was the entirety of Steve's knowledge about his father. Steve had all kinds of problems and issues and he found a home in our church and we prayed with him and we faithfully witnessed to him and taught him how to worship and pray. And all of that was really, really important. But it actually wasn't enough for Steve because Steve needed someone who would help him navigate the criminal justice system because he kept getting into trouble. Steve needed someone who would sort out his housing. Steve needed somebody who would just care for him and ultimately lead him through and be an advocate for him in the mental health system. Steve had loads and loads of problems and speaking the gospel to him was absolutely vital. Being alongside of him to do the work of justice as we walked with God was absolutely essential. The second story concerns a weeping bishop. 
I just started working for Tear Fund, the Christian Relief and Development Agency, and it was about 1996, and I was travelling to Rwanda. Now, Rwanda at that time uh, was two years out of its civil war. It was a horrible civil war that brought the word genocide back into modern usage. And Rwanda had been known as being a centre of revival. About 80% of Rwandans were in church every Sunday. But in 1994, an ancient tribal dispute between Hutu and Tutsi exploded. And in the space of a few months, something like a million people were killed. And many more were raped and hurt and wounded and made refugees. In a place where so many people claim to be Christians. I was travelling there to see Tear Fund's work in the aftermath of the war and I was staying in a guest house in Uganda and there I met a Rwandan bishop who was travelling from Rwanda to the west and I had dinner with him and he told me the stories of revival about when the churches were full and when God was very present and lots of good things happened and then he said this he said but we made a mistake we didn't teach the people that to have hatred in your heart for another human being was sin and would give the enemy space to destroy us. We just taught them about having their sins forgiven and going to heaven. We never taught them that racism was wrong. And then he said this, and when the enemy came, he found much in us to use. Jesus had said, when the enemy comes, he will find nothing in me. The bishop said, when the enemy came, he found much in us to use. And then I got scared because I thought if in Rwanda, in a place of revival, they grew up with a blind spot, that there was something that God really cared about, which they had missed. What was my blind spot having grown up Christian in the UK? What was I missing? And I think for us, it's missing the fact that as well as loving mercy, as well as walking humbly with God, God commands us to act for justice, to order the world in love, to work with him, particularly for those who are the most vulnerable and the most oppressed. And that's started my journey into how can I make Christ real and present in some of those difficult circumstances. It was a journey that took me to some of the world's travel spots with Tear Fund, and now into the fight against modern slavery with International Justice Mission. Over the last 20 years working in relief and development, I always have people ask me, isn't it heartbreaking? You go to places and see terrible suffering, witness inhumanity and violence and destruction. Doesn't it break your heart? Doesn't it sap your energy and faith? And it's true, I do go places and have seen Terrible things, terrible suffering and real difficulty. But my heart is not broken, it is full. And it is full of the people that I have met who have been extraordinary. People who should have given up, people who should have been destroyed. And yet with the power of God, they are walking and living and breathing and representing Christ in a world. I met a girl like this just a couple of months ago in Chennai, India. She is 17 and 18 months ago she was rescued from a brothel in Calcutta. She'd been there for two, two and a half years. Imagine, or rather don't. We were in a big hotel, very grand, because it was an award ceremony for people who had taken bold action to end slavery. Magistrates, police officers, local officials, very, very important politician from Delhi was the guest of honour giving the speech and this girl was in the room receiving an award as a survivor. She should have been so scared. She was young from an incredibly abused background and from an incredibly poor background and she was in a posh hotel with the great and the good. She should have been hiding in the shadows. She lit the room up. Because having been rescued and having been in aftercare and having experienced the love of God, not only was she experiencing restoration and healing, but she had found the courage and the call 
to be a voice back to her community, to go and speak and train other young girls and families on how to avoid the lure and the traps of the traffickers. She took my breath away, not because of the injustices that she had experienced, but because the God of justice had got inside her and given her new life. People often want to know how they can get involved in the justice ministry, how they can get involved living justice as serving the God of justice. And there's just a few things I always say. Number one and most important is dive into the Bible and dive into prayer. We serve the God of justice, the God who is just. So let's get to know him. The more you study the Bible, the more you talk with God in prayer, about injustice in the world, the more that your life and values will be shaped. One of the hardest things that we can do is to talk authentically to God about injustice, to bring the pain of others into his presence. But that's the place where we will hear his commission and we'll hear his guidance. So dive into the Bible, dive into prayer. Number two, justice, like evangelism, starts at home. Think about how you treat the people around you. How do you speak to people? How do you serve people? Who do you blank out? Where are your blind spots? Do you recognise the people who are begging on the streets or do you walk by? Do you notice who needs help and is struggling? Particularly the vulnerable, particularly those who don't fit in, particularly those who are not socially good. How do you treat the people around you? Or even how do you treat the person who serves your meal? Or how do you treat the person who is checking out your shop in the supermarket? Justice starts at home and it's about treating people right, treating people as God would treat them, ordering the world in love. And the third thing I always say is find out what God is doing locally and join in. It might be a food bank, it might be debt counselling, it might be all sorts of things. It might start by actually visiting and befriending and serving the people who are lonely and who are vulnerable in your own church, amongst your own family, amongst your own neighbours. Start where you are. There might be some established ministries like a food bank or like parish nursing or all sorts of other things. You can find lots of ideas around there of Christians who've got tried and tested ways of bringing justice to the world. Join in. And finally, Think beyond our shores. None of us feel rich, I wouldn't think. And yet we live in one of the richest countries in the world. And beyond our shores, there is huge injustice. Every two minutes, a child is sold into slavery. And they're sold into a brothel or a sweatshop or a rice field. And their childhood is lost and taken and they are brutalised. And God doesn't want children to be in brothels or rice fields or sweatshops. God wants children to be in families and playgrounds and schools. Why don't we join the fight to bring justice to those children, one every two minutes, who get sold? But whatever it is that you do, do something. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. That, says the prophet Micah, is what the Lord requires of us.